Good afternoon, everybody. Hello from New York. Uh, my name is Sean Sweeney. I'm talking to you this afternoon uh, from um, my office at, uh, in Midtown Manhattan. I am the coordinator of Trade Unions for Energy Democracy. I'm going to give a, um, a short presentation on what is Trade Unions for Energy Democracy, what it does, and um, what some of the work uh, we've been doing uh, since the project started in late 2012. Uh, before I get into my presentation, I want to thank the organizers for putting this very exciting and interesting event together. Uh, what I'm about to say is um, m uh, quite generic in nature, in the sense that some of the things don't necessarily apply uh, to New Zealand. I know you have particular challenges and opportunities there and uh, are dealing with a whole range of different issues. So I won't be able to get into too much detail about that, but I acknowledge those differences. I want to also um, say in absentia, um, hello to uh, Gary Cranston, who uh, set up the invitation and is also uh, speaking on this panel. Uh, Jared Abbott and Jeanette Fitzsimmons, and in particular, Sam Haggard from the uh, New Zealand Council of Trade Unions. Uh, so I'm going to get right into it and show you some visuals. Thank you. What is Trade Unions for Energy Democracy? It's a global network of 52 unions from 17 countries. It was launched in late 2012 at a conference in New York City, just a couple of weeks before Hurricane Sandy hit the uh, eastern region of the United States. and. It's um, been progressing and developing steadily since then. The essential uh, galvanizing idea for the project is that we need to take democratic control over the energy system um, because of its contribution to climate change in particular, but also uh, we cannot control um, or protect rather public health unless we can do something about the impacts of fossil fuel use. Uh, so it's a public health matter as well as a climate change issue. We also see that there are huge challenges um, facing workers in the industry. Their workers are losing their jobs in fossil fuels all over the world, are being basically thrown under a bus, as they say here in the United States. But also there's a rising level of repression of workers, uh, whether it be in South Africa or Kazakhstan or other parts of the world where there's been violent repression. Um, Latin America in particular, Honduras, Peru, there have been assassinations of worker and indigenous leaders who are resisting the, uh, uh, the extractivist methods of the fossil fuel com companies and the mineral companies. Now, it's all stewed, as we call it, Trade Unions for Energy Democracy, is also grounded in a particular kind of analysis. And the analysis points to uh, more fossil fuel use, not less, coming into the global energy system. We push back against the idea that the world is moving away from fossil fuels, that an energy transition to renewables is inevitable. We don't believe that's the case. And there's a consensus across uh, the unions in Chued that we are facing an energy emergency of epic proportions with more fossil fuels coming into the system globally. This uh, slide sort of sums it up to some extent. This is the Energy Information Agency 2015. It shows not just a steady increase since 1990 of coal, gas, and oil and petroleum products coming in, but also projected increases into the future. And there's not a single serious study that doesn't project an increase in the consumption of fossil fuels into the 2030s and even 2040s. Now, we're also keen to alert uh, unions around the world to the fact that unconventional fuels, extreme energy, are coming into the system, whether it be shale gas, shale oil, or in this picture, in this case, uh, tar sands from the Alberta tar sands. So there's more of this kind of fuel coming in, which is dirtier, more polluting, and more unhealthy 
and um, more difficult and more challenging in terms of uh, refining the materials. Now we um, are also the, in terms of the analysis of uh, CHUED, aware of the fact that the, or we take the view that market approaches are failing pretty much everywhere and that the idea that the a green economy, a low carbon future can be incentivized into existence uh, is a mistake. That there needs to be very decisive interventions that are often non-market in nature in order to move that agenda forward. The ideas of inclusive green growth and sustainable development have had a big influence not just on sort of big agencies and corporations and governments but also on the trade union movement as well. Uh, it was accepted by many unions that the transition to uh, a low carbon economy um, was inevitable and that our job as a labor movement was to make sure that that transition was fair, just and equitable. Uh, CHUED takes the view that the uh, transition is not inevitable. And when we look at that against the commitments made in Paris of complete decarbonization of the global economy by 2060 in a context of growth which uh, the World Bank projects the global economy will be three times larger in 2050 than it is today. We're facing not an uphill task but potentially an impossible task unless we take radical action to address uh, the crisis. So the science is acknowledged in the Paris Agreement with the well below two degrees Celsius threshold but and also the net zero emissions target. But the commitments made by countries um, don't add up to where the scientific, uh, uh, the scientific targets uh, suggest they should be. So just to sum up the political analysis of trade unions for energy democracy, the green transition is not inevitable in many respects. It's stalled. There's more renewable energy coming into the system, but it's not enough to replace fossil fuels and the use of coal, oil and gas, particularly oil and gas, has been growing dramatically in recent years. That to address or apprehend this situation, we need more democratic control over key sectors and energy is particularly important because of its contribution to uh, uh, emissions but also poor health and other um, other negative effects and we also feel that the trade union movement needs to uh, develop its own approach uh, to these questions and, um, and, and to break its uh, sort of connections with large agencies and large corporations who often put forward pro-market um, analyses. Now, turning to what does CHUA do? This is a picture of a meeting in New York of uh, maybe 20 unions that came together from different parts of the world on the eve of the People's Climate March. CHUA has had many now uh, meetings of bringing unions together to share ideas and data and to further develop our analysis. This analysis began with a paper produced in 2013 called Reclaim, Resist, Reclaim, Restructure, which offered a framework for dealing with the climate challenge and the energy emergency that was independent of the major environmental groups, but also independent of the large uh, energy companies. Since then, there's been seven or eight working papers. I'm going to show pictures of the two most recent. This one came out earlier this year, Carbon Markets After Paris. It did an analysis of the failure of carbon markets to uh, decrease emissions or control emissions and um, warned that this, uh, this method of controlling or mitigating emissions was, uh, n had not succeeded and was not likely to succeed in future. So this was a paper just highlighting those uh, data. This is one came out just a week ago, uh, which talks about the recent data from the World Health Organization and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change on the health impacts of fossil fuel use. So we, every few months we put out a new working paper, which is they're aimed uh, to further develop and elaborate uh, an independent analysis for unions in addressing climate change 
and uh, the negative effects of fossil fuels. We also try to encourage unions to be more assertive and proactive around in their campaigning work. This project, Unions Against Fracking, was launched uh, about uh, 13, 14 months ago. And we knew that some unions around the world were beginning to resist fracking and come out against it. And we wanted to provide uh, a platform for those unions. And they issued a statement calling for a global moratorium. That statement has been signed by, as you can see, quite a long list of national and regional trade union organizations and global union federations, as well as individual unions at branch and local level affiliates. So this is an open, um, open statement, if you like. The statement, uh, any union can sign on to this. And certainly if there are any unions present in the room this afternoon, uh, they can get in touch and sign on. We're also with Intuit promoting a movement building approach. The, what the uh, official trade union bodies have done uh, with some energy and some success is to lobby fora like the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change to try to get worker friendly language into the agreements. They've made strong arguments and they've been fighting a heroic battle on that front. However, I think it's uh, being, be, being made increasingly clear by political events that we really need um, to build uh, a global movement, not just to, um, for ecological transformation, but also for economic and social transformation. So the role of CHUED in many ways is to work in the spaces where those movements come together. You'll see a picture here of a meeting we organized at COP. 21 in Paris on December 8th with Jeremy Corbyn, Naomi Klein, and also union leaders from around the world. There were 700 people in attendance, and it could have been three or four times larger if we had a bigger hall. This is a picture of the People's Climate March in New York, where the, um, uh, the probably the largest ever climate march in history took place with very strong trade union participation. The international trade union presence on that march was organized by Trade Unions for Energy Democracy. There's political reasons for that. Uh, the International Trade Union Confederation was unfortunately unable to endorse the march because of resistance from some of the large U.S. affiliates, uh, although many U.S. unions did participate and bring out their members particularly unions that represent uh, people of color, immigrants, uh, and indigenous people, those unions are really stepping up to the challenge in the United States and elsewhere around the world. CHUED also believes there is a, a need for uh, the labor movement internationally to be, uh, play a larger role, if it can, in supporting other workers and uh, people's struggles uh, indigenous people in particular are on the front lines of uh, resisting the uh, energy companies, the extraction based companies. And this is a picture of um, uh, indigenous groups in Argentina opposing fracking in that part of the world. And they're supported by CTA and other unions in Argentina. The labor movement in North America uh, and other parts of the world has been playing an increasingly significant role in stopping fossil fuel projects. This one it refers to the Keystone XL pipeline. This was a particularly important struggle that was uh, unions opposed the pipeline along with students, youth, climate organizations, indigenous farmers and ranchers and were eventually successful in stopping the project being approved. Uh, other unions did support the project, believing there was jobs for their members in building this 1700 mile pipeline from the Alberta tar sands in Canada to refineries in Texas. We feel that this particular struggle is uh, emblematic of a cultural shift in uh, trade unions, not just in the United States, but also in other parts of the world where unions had traditionally not or been or rather they've been reluctant to oppose uh, projects that involved uh, creating jobs for other unions. 
now because of the health effects and the generally negative effects of fossil fuel expansion uh, and infrastructure, there is a desire to, or a, a, an increasing desire to, for unions to go on record and, um, and stop these projects. It's uh, not been possible for me to go over um, all the examples of trade union struggles around energy, but it's fairly clear, I believe, that struggles for the future of the global energy system are rising, whether they're driven by concerns about emissions, about repression of workers and workers' rights, about the uh, uh, land grabs and other forms of um, exploitation, whether there's concerns about public health, Energy is at the, uh, the heart of a, a trade union and working class agenda. And there will be more disputes and more conflicts around energy in the next decade or two. It's clear that the market-based approach to transitioning to renewable power has failed. And even where it's successful, it's being done in a way that's not particularly friendly to workers. So the role of CHUED is a work in progress. We're trying to continue to develop an analysis, continuing to broaden the network and include unions from all sectors in the struggle for the future of energy. But most important of all, we're trying to offer a mobilizing vision and inspiring vision of an energy future uh, for workers, communities and the planet. I want to thank you again for giving me the opportunity to tell you about Trade Unions for Energy Democracy. I'm looking forward to working with unions and the allies of trade unions in New Zealand in the future. Um, there's a lot for us to learn and to further develop the analysis and organizing around this work uh, for energy democracy. The Trade Unions for Energy Democracy website has a lot of materials there is, uh, it can be uh, reached through unionsforenergydemocracy.org. My email address is sweeneyjli at gmail.com. I'm happy to take any of your questions over email or over Skype in future. And I hope you've had a successful conference. I'm sure the remainder of the day will be excellent. And I look forward to hopefully being there in person next time. Thank you for having me and giving me the opportunity to say these words.